This meeting is being recorded. And now we'll start the prayer together. I'll put it up on the screen. I don't have mine with me either. Okay, let's say this together. Glory be to the Father, by his almighty power and love, created me in my Glory to the Son of God, who is the incarnation of the King Man, so that I could become God. Glory be to the Holy Spirit, who is the Son of God. Glory be to the Holy Spirit, who is the Son of God. Okay, we have that there, and um, I'm going to uh, show you, um, if I can here, uh, a couple of other, a uh, couple of other, uh, oops, okay, let's see if that works. I'm going to put everybody on mute. I realize we've got some background noise there. But um, I just forgive me here for a second while I no, get all this. No, he's uh, going to come here. Right here. Let's see. There we are. Okay. You can unmute yourself. And I thought we would start today because I'm talking to you from the rectory of a very nice priest. He's the pastor of a parish here in um, Lahui, Hawaii, which is on the island of Kauai. I've never been here before, but I'm very moved by the beauty. Maybe that's kind of provide an entry into our gathering today a little bit. I'm uh, trying to be a little bit quiet today because I'm in the room across from him, and I'm sure he's still sleeping here at 5.30 a.m., so he's got an early mass, but nevertheless, we'll try to keep it, keep it toned down a little bit. Um, but uh, he's been very, very accommodating. I'm so grateful to have a place to stay. And then uh, later today, I'm going to go do a memorial service for a ni very nice lady whose husband um, we buried a while back. I had had the funeral, apparently, for his his um, mother back at St. Richard's. And um, I received a call from his wife when Leo was in hospice. And had a chance to see him before he passed and they always had their most beautiful moments together as a couple over here in Kauai. So she wanted to go back to the place where they first met and, um, and remember him there at the spot of meeting and the spot of leaving. So we're gonna have a, have a lovely, uh, lovely, she's got about 10 of her friends here from St. Louis with her and I was honored to be invited as well since I was gonna be here anyway doing a retreat for the Carmelite sisters. So, which happens next week, I'm kind of being primarily a tourist today. So I'll share with you here um, a little bit about the beauty that I took in yesterday, probably overdid it a little bit because I'm, I'm um, pretty sore today, but I'll pull these photos up. I, I, I tried to select some to put up on the screen, but I don't know if um, they'll come out quite that way, but uh yeah here's a here's a i don't know if you can see those on the screen are they pretty clear some of the some of the pictures that i took yesterday let me see if this will actually play the video i don't think so anyway um i can see the pics you can't can you see them yeah yes i can see but i'm not going to see the pictures I I um yeah, so there. Uh, so I went up up and saw some of the the sites to see here in um, Kauai, Hawaii. And um, one of the things that, uh, and I and when I was up there, I um, well, I was I just really was trying to drink in the beauty. Number one, I woke up and it was about um, it was about seventy five degrees at just about eight o'clock in the morning. So I, so I, I, even though I was tired from the trip, I must have been overtired. I didn't sleep on the plane at all. But anyway, I was up, so I thought I'd get up and get going. So I got a couple of maps of the island and saw some of the lookout 
points that they have here to kind of where tourists normally go. And they have some trails as well that you can walk. And it was a beautifully clear day. Um, so I basically drove around all day yesterday and would get out and walk for an hour or so at different places and just tried to drink in the beauty. I showed you a couple of the pictures there that I took. Um, and when I was sitting up on one of the particular places, I have the, this little book that I brought with me called um, The Grain of Wheat by one of my favorite thinkers, Hans Urs von Balthasar. And so I took this little book along with me and uh, would find a comfortable place and watch some of the trekkers go by as I sat up there under the trees. A lot of roosters in Hawaii. <laughs> a couple of them came up and I think were kind of reading with me there. So I took a video or two of them as well and we had some good time together. Um, and this little book is just a little book of sayings by him. I admire him so very much. Um, and I wanted to read, I thought uh, part of the thing was I could, um, I could read you a thing or two that touched me yesterday. Except when I read things, they always seem to become less powerful when they first impacted me. But um, let me see if I can read this one to you that I came across yesterday. Uh, and he says this, only a person with a sense of symbolism has access to the world of the gospel because the gospel always teaches in a very concrete way. And here's the important line. Our understanding of the Bible stops precisely at that point where we make of it a textbook for religion and morality. <laughs> let, me, let me read you that again. Our understanding of the Bible stops precisely at that point where we make of it a textbook of religion and morality. Um, and then another line that uh, he always uh, always says in, in his writings, and it's a paragraph or two down, he says, problems should always become more luminous in the light of the great mystery in which we live and move and have our being. A sense of mystery is the purpose of the Catholic faith. Problems should always be seen, always become more luminous in the light of the great mystery in which we live and move and have our being. A sense of mystery is, a, is, a, is the purpose of the Catholic Church. Um, so next week, I, and I'm, I'll read, I'm, I'm reading those two because I, it seems like there's a lot there we could talk about, uh, you know, kind of making sure that we don't, that we, that we treasure the word of God, especially the scriptures, that we go to mass for word and sacrament, but that we don't identify the word of God with the actual words of scripture. The word of God, the eternal word, the per second person of the Trinity, speaks to us through those written words on a page, but scripture itself is just ink markings on papyrus. They become living when the Holy Spirit works his divine alchemy upon us, and he takes the, the ink blottings on the page, and he takes our biological optics. You see, everything about us, biology and the biology of the paper and the ink, all those chemical constituents of things that we call things, <laughs> they, are all, they are all matter. They're all made out of stuff. But what gives them meaning is the, is the form and the spirit that God has breathed into them. So we are living instances of the breath of God. We come from the breath of God. God speaks us into being. We are just like those markings on a piece of paper, black ink, you know, with the computer or a typewriter or pen and paper. 
those black markings are inert objects, the physical components that God uses to constitute what we call the world have a form to them. They have a coherence, they have a livingness. And that livingness, of course, is the presence and the breath of God. So I'm getting off, off the topic just a little bit here, but the main point is that everything we interpret as solid and physical actually looks to us and appears to us and, and presents itself to us as in breathed by the word and the breath of God. So we have to have a, and the Catholic faith is meant to develop in us a sense of the spiritual, the spiritual um, interiorness of everything that is. When I was sitting up on that mountaintop yesterday overlooking the valley of what they call Waimea here, W-A-I-M-E-I. -E they call it the Waimea Canyon. It's got several waterfalls. It's kind of one of those pictures you often see of Hawaii with the beautiful, the, you know, the uh, helicopters fly down the middle of the canyon to give people a closer look at the waterfalls. And what I noticed was there were so many beautiful birds just cruising and lofting within that canyon yesterday. And, and why does a person get inspired by that? Because all those images speak to us of our own inner constitution. We also are, are swimming, flying, as it were. We are flying in the, in the life of God, you know? If there's one line in the Bible that we want to constantly come back to, or maybe I should say that I constantly come back to, to remind myself of my reality in God and of God's reality in me. It's that beautiful line from uh, the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 23, I believe, 1728, 1728. Um, St. Paul's talking to the men of Athens, and they were great philosophers. They had the great philosopher Plato, the great philosopher Aristotle, and before him, you know, Hippocrates and uh, Pythagoras and Xenophon and the rest of the great um, Epicurus, the great Greek philosophers. And they, they also had a sense of the divine underpinnings of physical reality. Plato more than Aristotle, but Aristotle also realized that the, the shape that things have, the shape of plants, the shape of animals, the shape of valleys, the shape of mountains, they all inhere in physical realities, but they don't come from the physical reality. You can never break down the chemicals of a human decomposing corpse and find the person. The person is what gives life to the body, not the other way around. So we don't, uh, we don't die when our bodies die. The person that we are assumes a different form, a form that is able to be more intimate with God. So um, trying to re recall both our coherence with God. You know what coherence means? If you, if you take a piece of cloth and you dip it in some purple dye like Lydia did in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter two, I think. Lydia, she is the, she is the purveyor of purple, purple dye. She works, she, she works in garments that are dyed in purple. Well, if you dye a garment in purple, you take a white linen cloth and dip it in some purple dye, the dye will the dye will co-inhere, the dye will become co-inherent with, the dye will penetrate, will penetrate the object without itself becoming the object. The dye never changes its nature and the cloth does not change its nature. Dyes do not become fibers and fibers do not become liquid, but the liquid somehow adheres or, or co-inheres, it penetrates, it has intercourse with, it has, a, it has a communal union with the object with which it is now giving a different sheen, a different color. Well, that's what happens with us the closer we uh, open ourselves to God. He, he penetrates us like purple dye in a cloth. He saturates us with his own presence. Now, unlike the, the linen cloth and the dye, 
we already are born purple by the love that God created us with. You know, purple is a is a royal color. I know I'm mixing a lot of metaphors here, but I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will allow you to follow me in this meandering thing from Waimea Canyon all the way over to purple dyed cloth with Lydia in Acts 2. But they all they all go together, and I guess that's Balthazar's point. Catholic, cat, the Catholic faith is meant to engender a sense of mystery, and the primary mystery that the Catholic faith and the Christian faith in general is meant to engender in people, the main sense is this coherence of God with everything that he creates. So, you know, the to go back to our analogy and not to stretch it beyond its usefulness, but, you know, like the linen cloth being dyed by the purple dye, they become one in that act of dying, D-Y-E-I-N-G, dying, not, not dying as die, expiring. Um, unlike the purple cloth that, that receives, its, receives its purpleness at a so, certain point when the dyer, Lydia, decides to turn it purple, we are born already in a certain sense empurpled by God. And I'm comparing the purple of the dye now to the spirit of God. And it is rather, I guess, coincidental or, or synergistic. What do I want to say? Um, what's the word? Uh, serendipitous that I chose that example of purple dye because purple is a color usually associated with God. Remember, they dressed Jesus in purple when they brought him out before Pilate and said, behold, you're king. So kings are, are dressed in purple. And you and I, to use this analogy of the, the purple dyed cloth, you and I are already born with a faint, with a faint sheen of God's purple kingly life in us. We are born that way because we come from him. Everything that comes from God has God's watermark, as it were. You know what a watermark is. It's that, it's that light impression that tells you this was manufactured or this was made. And in our case, yeah, this was made by God. Sometimes uh, you can see it very faint if you hold it up to the light. Well, every child is born, every creature, really, even that little rooster who came up to me next to me yesterday while I was reading Balthazar in Waimea Valley, uh, that rooster had imprinted on him a watermark of God saying something like this, look at this rooster. I couldn't contain myself. I needed to, now I'm reading here. You see, I have spiritual vision. I'm able to read the watermark of God on this rooster. And it said, this rooster bears the watermark of the one who conceived of him. I thought that it would be another form of beauty. You think this valley before you stretching out to the end of the island is beautiful, but look at this rooster. He's just as beautiful in his own way. I have packaged my divine beauty into a form of a rooster and he belongs to me so that it is not given to you to treat him with any undue violence, even though I have made him to give you eggs, which I plan to have a little later at McDonald's. So, so there for that, huh? <laughs> but my point here is <laughs> little prophetic rant, you see. Uh, everything, everything, but especially every person bears the watermark or the empurpled sheen underlying uh, background color of God's kingly love. When we kids in Pennsylvania, when we used to, um, I had four brothers and we had a very small bandbox house, you know, one bedroom for my parents, one bedroom for five kids, two beds, three in one, two in the other, you know. I remember my father saying, <laughs> My father would come up the stairs. We knew it was time to be quiet. He says, do I have to take off my belt? I said, no, 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 you don't have to take off your belt. We're going, we're going straight to sleep. But when, um, when we'd be in the living room wrestling and fighting or playing, uh, we used to play football on our knees. I would kick off to my younger brothers. They would be, it would be four against one. I would be Notre Dame. They would be all the other teams. And then I would kind of kick off in the, in the living room. 
as long as they were beneath four years old, they were able to stand up. But after four, they had to get down on their knees too. And they would run plays and we would block. And my dad be sitting in the corner trying to read. And my mother would be ironing clothes in the kitchen, pulling out her hair, trying to wonder how I'm ever going to raise five boys with a husband who doesn't really give me much help. And uh, anyway, when things would get too chaotic, my father, <laughs> if one of my brothers started to cry because I tackled them too hard, my father would turn to me and he'd say, Philip, Thomas is under my protection. Don't touch him. And I knew what that meant, because if I touched him, I would be touched too, but in not, not in such a good way. So, uh, but that line of my father's, he kind of said it in jest, even, and we took it seriously, but it wasn't like a threat. He, we used to say uh, whenever, and most of us boys in the family then carried that over <laughs> into our relationships, either with our wives or with our other kids. Uh, whenever fights would break out, somebody would say, stop, I'm under dad's protection. <laughs> and I thought, that's a nice line to really describe all of our relationships with God, not, and not just human beings. I think even the, the things in nature, you know, um, that beautiful stream that I saw at the Valley of Waimea Canyon, Canyon yesterday, there was something about it that said to me, don't, 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 I'm, 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 I'm hesitating here because I don't want to be crude, but don't, uh, don't take a pee in me. I'm under God's protection. Don't violate me. I'm under God's protection. So the mountains say that, the roosters say that, and most of all people say that. You can see it in their eyes. Don't, don't, um, don't violate me. I'm under God's protection. So I start out with that quote from Balthazar and basically saying that um, our faith is meant to develop in us a sense of mystery that leads to a sense of reverence. We're to look at everything as an, not just an object of God's love. In fact, if there's one word, if there's a word you want to banish, if you can, from your vocabulary, that word is object. Um, whenever I have an object, the object of my trip, let's, let's just use me for an example here. And, and all of this, I suppose, today is tying together with a sense of mystery and a sense of over-literalism. Let me read that quote. I know, Cheryl, you joined us just a few minutes ago. I'm going to read that quote again and kind of anchor us in our thread for today's gathering. Um, and, and I'll come back to why I want you to banish the word object from your vocabulary. But the first, and this is from a little book by Hans Balthasar called The Grain of Wheat, a series of aphorisms. Don't try to buy it on Amazon. I just tried to buy it again yesterday. It's been about 25 years since I've read this book. I just picked it up and took it with me on the plane to Hawaii because I love Balthazar and I can read almost any of his writings and bring me right back to the vision that I need to live from and operate from and teach from uh, and preach from, for that matter, live from, really. Anyway, this passage struck me very strongly yesterday when I was reading it. I'll read it again. And then, well, there were two passages, so I'll read them both. The first one says this. Only a person with a sense of symbolism, by which he means a sense of mystery, has access to the world of the gospel. So the gospel's a world and not just words on a page. It's trying to, it's really a depiction of God's world. Only the person with a sense of symbolism has access to the world of the gospel because it always teaches, the gospel that is, it always teaches in a concrete way. In other words, the gospel writers were simple men, they were writing for simple people, so they were very concrete in the images that they used, and they were very literalistic in a way in the descriptions they gave of Jesus the man. And all that's good, all, all of that's good, but um, because every word they wrote is also the word of God, there's a depth to it that one cannot grasp just by reading it at the historical or literal level. You always have to ask, what is the larger implication here? 
What is, the, what is it saying to me about God? What is it saying to me about my relationship with God? Uh, show me the depth of it. Don't show me just the breadth of it. Show me the depth of it. So I'll start again. Only a person with a sense of deep symbolism has access to the world of the gospel because the gospel always teaches in a concrete way. And here's the important line. Our understanding of the Bible, I know all of you love to read the Bible. You hear all kinds of people saying, I always go back to the Bible. It doesn't help you to go back to the Bible unless you understand this next sentence. Our understanding of the Bible stops precisely at that point where we make of it a textbook for religion and morality. Our understanding of the Bible stops precisely at the point where we make of it a textbook of religion and morality. Let me separate, substitute a couple of other words there that will work just as well. Our understanding of God stops precisely at that point where we make him a master of religion and morality, or make him an enforcer of religion and morality. Our understanding of God stops precisely at that point where we make of God an enforcer or even a teacher of religion or morality. On the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus is not teaching morality. Blessed are the pure of heart. Blessed are those who um, are persecuted. Blessed are those who are meek. He's not giving us an instruction for morality. He's speaking autobiographically about those people who know themselves to be one with God. How blessed are they? And the word in Greek is really how ecstatic are they? How blissful are they? Anyway, I'll come back to the Sermon on the Mount. Here's the other line. Problems should always become more luminous in the light of the great mystery in which we live and move and have our being. A sense of mystery is the purpose of the Catholic faith. Problems always become more luminous in the light of the great mystery in which we live and move and have our being. That's Acts 18, 17, 28. A sense of mystery is the purpose of the Catholic faith. Okay, so the theme for today is, is uh, acquiring or developing, deepening our sense of mystery. Mystery does not mean a mystery like Hercule Poirot is trying to solve it. It's not a mystery like Sherlock Holmes. Mystery means um, being amazed at something. Uh, it's developing a sense of awe, A-W-E. Blessed is the person who fears God. What that means is blessed is the person who has an appreciation of God as an unfathomable mystery. Blessed is the person who sees the depth of reality as rooted in God. You know, it's 530 in the morning here, and I thought to myself, what am I going to say? Well, apparently we're able to talk at 5.30 in the morning, but I, I'm mentioning this to you because I had some, uh, I, I wouldn't say anxiety, that would be too strong a word. Uh, coming out on the plane, I had, a, I had a, an email from the sisters, the Carmelite sisters that I will be um, seeing next week. But, but, but before I say that, uh, uh, is everybody, I see, some, I see some attentive faces. Is, it, is everybody following me so far? about developing the sense of mystery. Okay, Dorothy's giving me the, the heads up, so I know I'm on the right track. Okay, so I, I, you, you, really I could talk to the sisters all week about the sense of mystery, and perhaps that's what I'll do, because I was at a loss. I, I, I'm really glad I came. My, my travel here was without a problem. I sat next to a very nice lady uh, on the plane. Um, I ended up getting in the first row with the bulkhead where I was able to stretch out my legs for 14 hours, which was a very nice thing to have. I was really, it's been a very blessed trip. And the priest here in, in Hawaii uh, could not be more accommodating to me. <clears throat> 
wish I had a little more money to leave him as a, as a donation. Uh, I know some of you have given me money recently, so I think I'll give it all to this priest, if you don't mind. It's such a, such a joy to be here. Um, but I, but I, I had a little trepidation because I, I had a note from Sister uh, Agnella, who's the mother superior at the Carmelites, just before I got on the plane, an email. <laughs> and I can just hear her, you know, in her, she came here from China, you know, she's 90, I think she's 91 or 92 years old. Such a, I just can't wait to see these sisters again. I did get the good news that they even had, they were down to three sisters at that convent at one time. I think I mentioned that to you. And when I gave them a retreat four years ago, they were slated to close because the bishop could not keep them open if they didn't have a community of at least five. Well, I heard from sister in my email that they're now up to seven. So I'm really just grateful for that. But and everybody here is still terrified of the pandemic. I was in a grocery store yesterday to buy a few apples for my lunch and uh, I was arrested by the mask police because I didn't have a mask on. I mean, you'd think I was bringing an Ebola or something, but I asked for, but I, I graciously appreciated taking the mask. She said, while you're in Hawaii, please honor our, I said, I certainly will. And of course, now I have to go to confession because I added, now you can sleep safely tonight. And you see, I, <laughs> maybe I'll ask this priest to hear my confession before I leave, but he'll make sure I put on a mask. No, he's, he's actually pretty good around that. Just kidding. I'll, we'll delete this part of the video. Okay, forget that. Okay, anyway, um, so Sister Agnella, um, and I can just hear her speaking to me. I told you about the last time I saw her. I think some of you heard this story, but I'll just tell it briefly here uh, for the moment. Last time I, I talked, uh, and sister is so good, she, I always ask her to write me out a special note that I can use to contemplate for the next year before I come back and talk to them again, or we get together. Really, it's the Holy Spirit talking. Their, their presence brings out the absolute best in me, such as it is. And um, so she, she wrote a little card. She first writes it in Chinese, then she writes it in English. And it's so, it's so endearing to me, but... Uh, I think the last time she said, the father knows you, the son loves you, and the spirit uses you, or something something to that effect. I, I have this little Lexio Divina room that I use at home uh, at uh, St. Andrews to prepare homilies and such, and I have that card sitting right up there where I can see it before I start writing every day, asking God to make that little prophecy of sisters come true. Anyway, in the email, the well, last time I was there, she took me aside after the conferences. And I know she just, let, I mean, she's, she always gets me to promise that I'll come back the next year. And so I'm, I feel very affirmed and very loved there. Uh, but the last time I was there, she, she took me aside at the end and <laughs> she said to me, Father, oh, Father, she said, you talk to us about Holy Trinity. Father, we're so grateful to learn about the Holy Trinity. She says, Father, when you talk about Holy Trinity, she said, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit give you, Father, so many ideas, Father, about Holy Trinity. And then there's this pregnant pause, you know, and then she says, but Father, Maybe, Father, one idea at a time. <laughs> I said, okay, sister, I'll try to untangle it a little bit next time. But of course, it never works. Anyway, um, long point to this story. In her email to me just before getting on the plane two days ago, she said, uh, Father, um, only two of the sisters are vaccinated, five others are not. So <clears throat> the sisters who aren't vaccinated are requesting that instead of coming into the, into the place where I normally give the conferences. So what they normally do is they have this little, they have a little chapel there and they have their little pray dues and prayer desks set up uh, in two different rows. And then I, they set up a little table for me and I just sit there 
maybe 10 or 12 feet away from the sisters giving the talks with my little, I always bring my singing bowl with me. And, you know, in that environment there, sitting in their own cloister, um, you know, I feel very connected with them. But she said, the sisters are asking if you would um, be in the sanctuary of the chapel for the public, which is set back about 25, 25 feet or so from where they are. And it's separated by their metal grill, you know, so I can see through it and I can kind of see on the other side. So when the priest comes there to say mass, he says mass in the sanctuary. And to the right of the priest is a public area for people to come in and go to mass daily. And then to the left behind the wall and behind the grill are the sisters who are who can't be seen by the public, but can be seen by the priest during the mass. So I'll have to be outside the grill sitting on the other side. So I, I wrote to sister and, and, and as soon as I heard that news, I could feel my heart sink. Not only I, I could feel my heart sink, but I felt like that connection between the sisters and me had been broken. And she, her initial email to me said, could you please stand at the microphone in the sanctuary where the priest reads the gospel? Well, if I stand at the microphone, number one, I don't know if I can stand for four hours at a time. And, and secondly, um, the microphone's facing towards the people in the public, not towards the sisters. So I'd be preaching to an empty church, talking to an empty church, hoping the sisters could hear me. And that's definitely not going to work very well for me. I need to see, even if it's on Zoom, I mean, Dorothy Perry and I talk about this all the time. It's one thing seeing you on Zoom, and I know you're present to me, and I can feel your presence, you know, 5,000 miles away, but it's not the same. Uh, there's a chemistry about being in proximity. Uh, at the same time, um, the thought came to me, presumably, I hope and pray from the Holy Spirit. At the same time, the thought came to me something that I say often, both with my son, Ben, and with my friend, Dorothy, and other friends that I have. And I'll probably say again today in the memorial service for my friend, Leo, over um, on, the, on the coast of Kauai. And that is this, uh, you know, absence in, in, the, in the colloquial language, we say absence makes the heart grow fonder. But what Balthazar reminds us of is that within the Trinity, especially in the Paschal mystery, God makes clear that absence makes the heart grow fonder as well. In other words, love is not eliminated by absence, but it assumes a different form. And it takes, it, it, it takes another form. It, it, uh, it connects people. The connection is never broken in absence. If anything, the connection is strengthened in absence. That's why separate vacations are always a good thing for married couples. Separation is a great idea for couples who are struggling. Because when I'm too close to somebody or when love only involves next to-ness, I'm next to you, and when love only involves embracing and not breathing space, it becomes cloying, becomes clinging, becomes enmeshment, becomes codependence, becomes smothering, becomes suffocation becomes oppression, it, there's no gap, there's no, there's no where for presence to go. Presence has been absorbed by the other. So it's very difficult actually to be with the one you love without distorting the love. And so I'm sure some of that, and I could go on for the whole rest of the gathering talking about that as well. And I suppose I will in the sense that it ties in with our original catalyst for this gathering, which is this developing sense of being a Catholic means developing a sense of mystery. And that means developing a sense of spaciousness, developing a sense of allowingness, developing a sense of letting be-ness. When someone is taking, taken from me, I let it be. I don't resist. Resistance is wanting to have things my way. 
And when I want to have things my way, it means that it's not just that it's selfish. There, there's nothing wrong with being selfish if the selfishness comes from the space of the self as God knows the self. Because when I'm selfish in God, I want nothing for myself, meaning myself as I have labeled myself or myself as those know me to be in the superficial world. Knowing myself in mystery is different from knowing myself as a person who operates on the horizontal level defined primarily by the labels and the functions and the activities that I'm engaged in. I'm, I am, you know, I am always greater than that which I think I am. And so I have to move beyond thinking into personhood. And personhood is experiencing myself as a mystery in the mystery. I have to forego definitions of myself. I have to forego images of myself. I have to forego all judgments about myself. I have to simply ask, as St. Francis of Assisi, ask of Christ, who are you and who am I? So true self-knowledge is relinquishment of all superficial or surface identity. I don't want to talk too much more about that. I just want to say that um, we want to discover ourselves as mysteries in the mystery. And we want to discover the world as a mystery in the mystery as well. You know, scientists, um, you know, I, I have watched a lot of the scientific discussion uh, such as you can find it about, uh, about the pandemic. Not, not so much because I wanna argue or even think about any further the politics of the pandemic, but I'm always, I'm always intrigued and I always want to know more about people who have a scientific bent in their lives who are, who are constellated such that they love to inquire about nature, whether it's geographically and, and um, geologically about things like the canyon that I'm overlooking here. The first, <laughs> when I came to my first lookout point yesterday, having paid $15 to park, uh, when I came to my first lookout point, um, I saw a couple ooing and eyeing over the canyon. When, and the lady said to the man, look at this thing. It looks like the Grand Canyon. And I just happened to be walking past them. And I said, yeah, that probably wasn't accomplished overnight. And I thought to myself, because I know nothing about this, I failed geology in college, you know, but I know that there was some sort of some sort of glacial or, uh, or um, volcanic genesis, at least in this world, to the beauty that we're beholding here. And I'm, I'm, and and I, and even though it's not my inclination and it's not the way that I'm made, um, I greatly uh, admire and love to learn from those who do inquire in that manner because I realize what they are doing, what a scientist is doing is the exact same thing that I'm encouraging us to do this morning on this Zoom gathering. That is to say, delve deeper into the mystery because if I'm a true scientist and it seems to me listening to the Corona debate and discussion that there's not a whole lot of sci actual science going out there because science is, is such that you can never be established in any ultimate reality because one revelation gives way to another revelation and there are constant revolutions in our notion of what is really real. You know, the, 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 geo, the, the astrophysics of Kepler 
gave way to Galileo and Galileo gave way to Einstein and Einstein gave way to Heisenberg. And Heisenberg's giving way to, you know, those who are in pursuit of a quantum computer. So what the fundaments of reality are and, and, and the reason the new atheists are so profoundly mistaken and because they will never get to what they're looking for is because at the foundation of even subatomic reality, there is a form there. There is a, there is a soul there by, by which I mean there is an inherent structure that can never be captured. It comes from outside the physical realm. Every animal has a soul, meaning every animal has a particular form that may vary from one species to another and from one member of the species to another. But that which accounts for speciesness or um, what's the next level up for genus, that which accounts for the fact that there are genuses or species, that which accounts for those things can never be found in the things themselves. The form, what the early church fathers called the logos, you remember that word, Jesus, logos in the beginning was the logos. Jesus is the logos of God. That means Jesus is the invisible form of God made visible. The rooster that I saw yesterday <clears throat> is one visible expression of something called roosterness. <laughs> roosterness is something that is in the mind of God. God decided I didn't have enough beauty in this world with canyons and stars and streams and hesslers. I had to create roosters as well. Why not? Roosters would be a nice thing to have in the world. Just as creation is continually, or the universe continues to expand, the reason for that is that once God starts thinking of beautiful things, he can't stop. Either God is like me or I am like God, but once he starts talking, everything pours out and you never know what's coming next. And <laughs> that's really true with me and with God. So if you ever wonder why do I exist or what's my purpose in life, I can tell you very simply. You're there because God needed more beauty in the world. And the world could not be as beautiful if you weren't there. And once you start to see that everything that is, is because God could not contain his impulse for beauty, then you'll begin to develop a Catholic sense of mystery. Now I'm gonna give you a, what do they call it? A spoiler alert. <laughs> I can hear the other priest beginning to stir here, and I don't know if I stirred him, you know, but I know he'll want to stir his coffee here pretty soon. So at the bottom of the hour, which will be one hour from when we started, 10 minutes from now, I think we'll wrap up the gathering for today with your permission. I should have um, a little more leeway next week at the monastery to uh, go our full hour and a half. But I think for today, we're going to keep it at one hour, and then we'll go from there. In him, we live and move and have our being. You know, the, the thing that has inspired me, the Rosetta Stone of my own part, my own specific spirituality and inspiration for the gatherings, probably for the last six months or so, I'm sure for all my life. Um, and you all know that my, my, my uh, defining, 
defining phrase always is God became man so man could become God. The coherence of humanity with the logos of, of God, the form of Christ. We are, as a single human entity, the humanity of Christ. Christ becomes human in you and me. He was born of Mary, but each of us was conceived before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in him. So you might say that Jesus of Nazareth was a, not a spoiler alert, but a preview. Jesus of Nazareth was a single person preview of what humanity's entire destiny is to be. The Son of God. In its fullness, the mystery of the Son of God in its fullness includes every person who ever came forth as a word of beauty from God as a constituent element or cell or member of his Son. We are created in the Son, through the Son, and for the Son. We are, as it were, to just switch analogies here briefly, we are little jigsaw puzzle pieces that when assembled by the Holy Spirit through history will constitute the visible face of God. And if you want to know what that final face of God will look like, just read the New Testament and look at that man you see there, and you and I will be blissful pieces of that person. That's the kind of mystical sense that one must have in order to appreciate yourself as a person and the Gospels as they are written. They talk about Jesus as someone separate from ourselves, but in God, we are all one. Humanity is the fullest extension of the humanity of Christ. And that vision, once it solidifies itself in your spirit, will allow you to view even people who say, put on your mask, as well-intentioned and beautiful at the deepest place in their being. And it may even allow you to recognize that they're giving expression to their beauty in the best way that they know how at the moment. It's a lot to keep in mind and no one can keep it in mind. It must go from the mind to the heart. And that's always the purpose of contemplative prayer. I must rest in God and most of all, realize God is taking his rest in me. God is abiding in me, and I am abiding in God. Hold fast to that word abiding. Think of a grandmother abiding with her grandchild. Find the dearest love in your life and think of just holding it. Maybe that will be your entree into God. When I hold another person, I'm really holding myself in God. What I do to you, I do to me. What I do for you, I do for me. Because in Christ, you and me are the same person. Even though we have different, we are different faces of the same beauty. So there's a kinship here at a depth that no human mind can ever fathom. And it's a kinship that is meant to constitute human friendship. And it's especially a bond that is meant to illumine the communion that we celebrate at Holy Communion, even though the Catholic Church is best known for nobody knowing who they're sitting next to. 
And that's okay too. I don't need to know who I'm sitting next to as long as I realize I'm sitting next to myself. You know, we have to come back again and again to the first description of God that he gave. I am who I am. And you are who you are because I am who I am. I am he who needs you to be fully me. Or let me rephrase. I am he who needs you to be in him who is my beloved son. And I need my beloved son in order to be who I am because he is never without me. I am who I am because he is who he is. And you are who you are because he is who he is only because you are who you are. I know it's starting to sound a little bit like Dr. Seuss here, but there's no way to avoid it. Just as the Father is the Father because of the Son. In other words, we use the word Father, not just God. We use the word Father because it describes the relationship of the first person of the Trinity with the eternally present second person of the Trinity. It's their relationship of one to the other, subordinate to the superior son to the father, that we label them father and son because of the nature of their relationship. The second person is a person of beholdenness. The first person is the first person of begottenness. He begets the son. The son is the begotten one. And as the begotten one, he is the beholden one. And when we are begotten by God, we are so begotten in order to be constituent members of the one who is the only begotten. So we are begotten by God to be in the one who is begotten of God. Jesus is begotten of God. We are begotten by God through the Holy Spirit in order to be members of the one who is begotten of God. We are God by participation. Jesus is God by nature. That's the meaning of the phrase, God became man so we could become God. We are who he is by participation, and he is who he is by union with his father. I'm going to leave it at that for the day. I can hear Father get ready for Mass. So thank you for joining me. I don't think I'll go back to bed now. You've got me too stirred up. But I'll wish you a happy day, and I ask for your prayers with the Sisters of the Carmelites. We'll finish with the glory be, huh? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great